All right, we've come to our panel 10, which we've entitled, What Does Effective Reintegration Programming Look Like? So I'll just start with a few observations. Um, having worked on projects that have tried to understand this question over a period of years. And I think one of the first questions back to all of us is, is what kind of outcomes would we use to understand effective reintegration? And the problem is, is that when different parts of the community have tried to answer this question, they've often used very different outcomes, very different metrics. So it's hard to kind of learn across. And that's in part what the MEAC project was all about, was to get the community together, to work with academics, to work with practitioners, and try to have an agreed understanding of where we're going. Um, but that is not always sort of reflective of, of the case or all of the different assessment and research efforts out there. As you've heard over the last couple of days, what we've tried to do is have a set of metrics about conflict orientation and a wider set of metrics. Recognizing the absence of conflict involvement does not necessarily equal successful reintegration. But this raises a bit of a complexity, right? It is possible to do well on certain metrics, so desistance, uh, but to be completely integrated still into a group of armed actors. That, is that a mixed success? What do we call that, right? So it gets quite complicated. Um, and so where is this metric that we would cut off of success, right? Especially if we're doing this in a multi-dimensional way, um, what would we constitute as success? And when do we measure it? And this is the other thing. We've spent the last two days talking about reintegration as a process. So at what point in the process do you take a measurement and decide, this is the time that it would be appropriate to establish whether you're successfully reintegrated or not. And I think what this does is highlights a really practical challenge we have for moving forward, which is when I talk to practitioner partners in the field, they are asked by their donors, they, they had themselves for their own sort of prog project management are trying to understand the caseload, who is not reintegrated, and who is reintegrated? What if we're using this complex, multi-dimensional set of outcomes to measure reintegration, and we're taking that and trying to shoehorn it into a dichotomy of, you're okay, you're still not. So that's a tension point. How do we navigate it? Because practitioners have real needs, donors have real questions, but the reality on the ground is complex. All right, so. How do we rectify that? That's one question moving forward. And I think some of our panelists have some ideas or they have pieces of emerging evidence that contribute to this. And I think one of the th observations we need to start off with on a panel like this is we cannot allow the perfect um, to be the enemy of the good, right? This idea that we're never going to have all the answers, but we have this caseload in front of us. We're faced with these issues. So we have to keep moving while generating this evidence as we go. I'm gonna highlight three complications that we need to keep in mind as we do this. We spend a lot of time putting the onus of reintegration on the shoulders of the ex-combatant or the former armed group associate or the family that is perceived as affiliated, uh, but it's a two-way street. And so we cannot view this as a silo. We have to understand the community. If you have an ex-combatant who is poor, but everybody is poor, you know, did that livelihoods program fail? So I think this is really important for us to keep in mind as we go forward. Another thing is we can't just reverse the reasons someone went in. Because the reasons they went in are not why they stayed and you didn't reverse them and they just popped out. Um, and what they face since, I think, it really, really matters. And I'll, I'll highlight one last challenge and this is particularly important in two of the cases we've been talking a lot about today. We spend a lot of time in preparing reintegration interventions, thinking about what life was like for this individual during the conflict, during time with the armed group. And we focus our interventions there, the trauma of being associated with one of these groups, the lack of education from the time in the group. But we really don't talk about where they've been since. And for some of these people, they have been detained for years, sometimes in terrible conditions.
And so we really do need, when we evaluate reintegration success, to understand that whole journey and understand the impact of that time, the time we often just sort of discount or forget about. And so that's another question. Even if you have a great livelihoods intervention to address the challenge of having been associated, does it, does it address the time in the group? So that lays out a lot of challenges to assessing the impact, the progress people are making and the impact of various programs uh, towards promoting those successful reintegration stories. But I think we have several different perspectives on different populations, different conflicts, uh, meta-analysis, uh, individual interviews with people who have been in this situation, and how to sort of translate all of that into how we move forward. So I'm very excited to talk to this panel today and for you to hear from all of them. Um, I will first turn to Mary Beth Atelier, who comes from NYU and will allow us to sort of understand the scope of research in this space. What other studies are out there about the impact of these types of programs on reintegration success and how can we that apply that evidence base uh, to our policy and practice? Over to you. Great, thank you. Um, so I wanted to begin just by thanking Siobhan uh, and the MIAC project for the opportunity to speak today on this final panel. I think the work that is being done by this project is absolutely essential uh, for deepening, deepening our understanding of these processes. Uh, so as Siobhan mentioned, I wanted to use this time to share some insights based on the previous panels, my own research, and this meta-analysis um, of the DDR literature that I conducted for the United States Institute of Peace. So I'm very sad that, that Chris left. So Chris, Chris was sort of part of the genesis of this project. Um, but the report reviews over 30 years of research on DDR, so over 372 sources. I spent the summer of July 2020, I think it was, reading uh, these 372 sources on DDR to draw lessons learned on what effective reintegration programming uh, should entail, and also what it should not entail. So given the time constraints, I'm going to focus on the key findings, uh, many of which have been highlighted here over the past few days. Um, and I would urge you to read the report uh, to, to you know, consider the specific examples and evidence base that underlie those key lessons learned. Um, before I go into the lessons learned, this works. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what successful reintegration looks like for an individual. So we spent a lot of time talking about reintegration, but what is actually a reintegration success? And I think it's important to distinguish uh, between what Siobhan mentioned, which is desistance and reintegration. Uh, so when we talk about, and I'm going to focus primarily on reintegration, I'm happy to talk later on with any of you over a drink <laughs> about desistance. Um, but when we talk about reintegration, successful reintegration is the process by which those leaving an armed group establish a pro-social conventional role within society and importantly, a pro-social identity. And the literature talks a lot about reintegration along three dimensions. So the first is economic reintegration and that is the means by which an individual um, establishes a sustainable livelihood through civilian employment. Uh, the second dimension of reintegration, and I think the most important, which I'll get to in a minute, is social reintegration. And that means that the individual is accepted by their peers, their neighbors, their family, and society at large. And finally, there's political reintegration, which I don't think we discuss enough. Um, but here, this means that individuals must feel that they are part of the decision-making process within their community and within their polity. Um, and so the literature talks about the fact that that decision-making process doesn't have to be perfect, but they need to feel like they're a part of it. And so political reintegration is key for long-term stability because by having a voice in government, those reintegrating are able to channel any current or future grievances nonviolently. So now that we've covered what successful reintegration is, that's what we're trying to achieve, I was going to review four broad lessons from the literature for reintegration programming, and I'm going to focus on the first two primarily. Let's see. All right, so the first lesson is to consider who is reintegrating and into what, and I've heard this discussed um, a bit over the past, uh, the past few days. Uh, so in terms of the who, I think we all know that programming needs to account for individuals' differing motivations, uh, for involvement, but also their skills and desires. So individuals, as Siobhan uh, mentioned, become involved in groups for very different reasons, uh, I think as we all here know. Um, but the things that motivate and sustain their involvement over time and also the re-involvement change. And so I think in terms of um, assessment and understanding individuals, this needs to be a long-term process because just what motivates somebody's 
involvement at intake, right, and what motivates it later down the line, let's say they re-engage, those things can be very, very different. Um, so I do think there should be a very deliberate information gathering exercise at the beginning of programming. I would also add that there's great utility. So I know you guys are, are looking for shortcuts sometimes, right? It's very hard to assess everyone individually, but when we think about programming, there is great utility, I think, in considering the roles that individuals held while involved in an armed group or associated with an armed group, right? So many of the individuals we're talking about weren't actually involved but are associated with that armed group. So previous research that I've conducted on violent extremism shows that while no one's involvement is the same, there are specific role-related patterns that we can observe. Um, so individuals in certain roles are more or less likely to experience different sources of disillusionment with their involvement. And we also find that individuals in certain roles, so particularly violent operatives and um, those who are in leadership roles, they experience more sunk costs and fewer alternatives outside of the armed group. So this makes reintegration much more difficult, uh, even if they're deeply disillusioned. Now, with regards to the famous reintegration into what question, we need to consider seriously the environments that individuals are reintegrating into. So why is this important? I think we all know that economic reintegration is impossible, right, in certain environments. So comparative research shows that reintegration programs in Africa systematically underperform in certain countries simply because of the level of economic development. I'm doing a horrible job on my slides here. <laughs> um, the second thing is that successful disengagement and re reintegration require a minimum threshold of security. So individuals are unlikely to disengage or remain disengaged if it puts their safety at risk. In Afghanistan, research shows that participation in reintegration programming was higher where the state could exert a minimum threshold of territorial control. And in numerous places, Colombia, Somalia, the DRC, Haiti, Sierra Leone, there's evidence that those who are reintegrating faced often violent and even deadly reprisals. Third, mutual trust between all parties, including the state, is critical for successful reintegration. So draconian state policies, exclusionary politics, and the absence of confidence-building measures fuel the grievances that may have led to individuals' involvement in the first place, and they impede reintegration. So reintegration programming, I know this is a tall order, but it must work in conjunction with or alongside other measures to address these structural issues. I think we focus so much on the technical aspects that sometimes we lose sight of these. So these are slow moving and they're difficult to change, but adopting a Band-Aid approach and losing sight of these necessary institutional changes are going to render political violence a serious problem for the future. And this leads to what I call the revolving door program. So you, or the revolving door problem, sorry. So you can have a very effective reintegration program. Um, but if you fail to address those societal or structural institutional issues, you will always have a need for a program. So you're always gonna have somebody going out and you're always gonna have somebody coming in. It's also true that successful reintegration is less likely in such environments. So the second lesson is that successful reintegration is social reintegration. And social reintegration is the most important. So research shows that if individuals have trouble reintegrating socially, they also have trouble reintegrating economically and politically. It's important for individuals to develop pro-social bonds. Uh, we know that, pro-social bonds. We know the from the literature on criminology that pro-social bonds uh, help individuals develop pro-social attitudes, so if we're talking about de-radicalization, and also pro-social relationships in society. One of the things that impedes the development of the, these pro-social bonds that I've heard discussed over the past few days is stigmatization. So how do we combat stigma? So the first thing is that policy practitioner and programming discourse often contribute to stigmatization. There's substantial evidence of this from the DDR literature. I think we need to think more carefully about the words that we use to describe programming, policies, and participants. Second, there's a lot of research from the DDR literature that shows that community sensitization measures can help foster assistance. Uh, strategic communications and educational initiatives that stress the importance of reintegration, uh, the nature of those who are involved. I know we talked in our, our session about um, the blurriness between victims and perpetrators. Uh, these can help reduce stigma. There's also evidence that well-designed community-based projects can help eradicate stigma and discrimination. So these projects benefit a larger segment of society, embody a commitment to a shared future, highlight the incredible social capital those reintegrating wield, serve as a form of reparations, and actually offer those who are reintegrating a new pro-social identity. 
Um, finally, there's some work on framing. So I'm doing some work with um, Gordon Club uh, over in the UK, and we're finding that the way in which programming is framed and even mentioning that individuals participate in a rehabilitation program can help reduce stigma. So individuals are more likely to invite an ex-offender over for tea or less likely to avoid them if they know they've participated in rehabilitation programming and drawing on the literature on criminology, we think that this signals redeemability. Uh, so real quickly, because I know I'm, I'm almost out of time here. Um, so the third broad lesson from the literature is that reintegration programming must avoid creating new grievances. I know this sounds a little bit trivial to talk about it, but time and again, these programs have generated grievances among an already vulnerable population. There have been cases where programs do not manage participants' expectations and do not deliver on their promises. Um, second, and related to what Siobhan mentioned, research shows that holding individuals for lengthy periods of time and or in inhumane conditions, which we know is what's going on um, in Iraq and Syria, often leads to discourses of resistance against the state um, and impedes reintegration. It also makes it harder for the community. Actually, there are studies that show that this increases the stigma of that population. Um, and so I really firmly believe that time spent in voluntary or involuntary confinement should contribute to, should be a po have a positive impact on individuals' reintegration so that they can see a life for themselves outside of the, uh, the armed group and start developing that, that pro-social identity. Um, the fourth broad lesson from the literature is that you know, when we are in the initial phases of thinking about programming, we really need to start thinking long term. Uh, lack of long-term planning, coordination, and funding can exacerbate social tensions, fuel distrust, uh, increase the costs, uh, and reduce the effectiveness of initiatives. Uh, the emphasis on short-term games and short-term gains in programming. So some of this, you know, um, these statistics Siobhan mentioned. You know, how many people have reintegrated? How many? Right? These these sort of short-term gains gains <laughs> often undermine long-term object objectives. So again, especially as they relate to those. Um, larger structural changes. So there are cases like in Afghanistan or Iraq where um, you know, programs or, or certain external actors were working with um, you know, unsavory actors and, and things like that. So, so those sort of short-term games can undermine long-term objectives. Uh, when it comes to studying reintegration, um, I would encourage uh, those who are, who are engaged in this endeavor to not only study those who participate in programming, but also as researchers to look at individuals who are reintegrating outside programming. I think that can also offer very, very valuable lessons. Um, I would also consider related fields. So I'm doing some work on the US on reintegration of violent extremist offenders in the US. And I had a very similar finding uh, to Zoe Marks. So finding that women are less supportive of reintegration of violent extremist offenders. So I do think that there are while there are differences across cases, there are very, a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, determining programming effectiveness, I think uh, to your, your question, Siobhan, I think we need to start thinking, one, measuring these things over time, which I know MIAC is doing, um, but also instead of just focusing on recidivism rates or how many people are successfully reintegrated, I think it's really hard to say, you know, this person will never go back to violence. But I think if we can start developing metrics, you know, do they have friends outside the group? Um, do they have a job where they're interacting with individuals outside the group? So really focusing on how well that individual is reintegrated. Um, because what is what you would hope and what the literature suggests is that over time, those ties that they're establishing outside the group would serve as protective factors and reduce the risk of re-engagement with an armed group. We can't say they never will ever re-engage with an armed group, but, but over time, they're less likely to. And finally, I think research on programming effectiveness needs to not only consider success at the individual level, right? So, you know, how many people went through my program? How successful is it? Um, but is this program actually reducing violence at the societal level? Or are these DDR measures or other measures, you know, that the UN or other actors are implement, implementing reducing violence at this societal level? Because again, this gets to this revolving door program. You can problem, <laughs> revolving door problem. You can have a very successful program, right? But if you're not actually reducing violence at the societal level, then I'm not really sure you know, what, what the point of that, that program is. So thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Beth. And I think you know, it's for practitioners in the room, we were having this discussion earlier about how hard it is to keep on top of all the evidence. So it's really nice when someone comes in and has looked at 372 different studies um, and tries to summarize that for you in a 
eight minute presentation. So I think the report's out there and I think it's a great way to sort of start delving into other studies that aren't being presented here in depth. I'd like to turn to my colleague, Ramaji, who's gonna present some of the work that we've done together, plus uh, some of his own observations from work ISS has done on uh, reintegration, exit and reintegration progress in the Lake Chad Basin. Ramaji. Okay, uh, thank you, Shoban. Good afternoon. So uh, I'm here back again to maybe try to contextualize also what I've just been said uh, to the situation we observe in the, in the Lake Chad Basin. Uh, I will try then not to get back again to the methodology because it has been uh, about that. But I will try to see what are the needs uh, of people when they are getting out of the, the armed groups. And then also examine the kind of support that they receive and that really for themselves have been helpful. And uh, try then to finish with uh, some metrics on the reintegration process. Uh, I won't say absolutely progress, but maybe progress and challenges. Uh, we should start uh, talking about that by examining the situation where, uh, from where those people are coming. And uh, it's a situation where uh, the victimization has been very high for all the people we have been uh, surveying, uh, meaning uh, community members, but also ex-associate, uh, also following gender, gender lines. And when we talked about uh, um, uh, victimization, uh, it's a mix of property loss, uh, of family members that have been killed, uh, also people that have been abused physically, but uh, sometimes also uh, sexually. Uh, and uh, the situation is uh, more complicated for female uh, ex-associate because the victimization rate is higher uh, for them than uh, any other um, category. And uh, regarding sexual um, violence, it's also uh, clear that it's higher uh, within uh, female ex-associate. But we observe that also some males have been abused uh, sexually. Uh, so it's a situation when talking about finding solutions uh, to people that have been sexually abused, uh, we think that boys and men should also be considered uh, in that situation. And uh, something particular with this uh, situation is that in a country like Chad, for example, uh, only 49% of people that have been uh, actually suffering from uh, sexual abuses uh, pointed Boko Haram or the, one of the factions as being the author of those abuses, meaning that uh, it's a situation where state actors, uh, mainly those intervening in security, have also been involved uh, on committing those, uh, those abuses. Uh, now, about uh, reintegration, uh, we try to see, you know, what for the people we are talking about uh, is really important uh, as um, the support they receive when they get out of, uh, uh, of, uh, of armed groups and here uh, from Boko Haram. And in uh, all the cases, we see that uh, the, 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 the most frequent response is that they receive nothing. Uh, meaning that they have not received any help from the state or uh, from, the, from the NGOs. And then uh, we also ask them, in case they receive any help, uh, which kind of help is really meaningful for them. And we see that it's always about uh, very basic uh, need support, meaning food, uh, housing, water, uh, etc. And then we also uh, try to go further uh, by asking this question about if those are very people we have been talking to, if they were in charge of uh, giving support to people that are getting uh, out of those groups, the answer is also the same. For them, uh, it's very important for them that uh, the basic needs remain uh, the, 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 the most uh, important support to be given to people that are getting out uh, of, uh, of those groups. And this uh, talk to uh, first, the situation that they have been living uh, when they were with Boko Haram, but also uh, it talks also to the situation in the region in general. Most of them, when joining communities, are joining communities that are also already uh, living in very difficult conditions. So <coughs> now, uh, about recidivism, uh, something very common in the, the lecture basin uh, in terms of expectation is that it has been expected that most of the people, because of the conditions they are living, might be um, 
going back to Boko Haram. But what we observe from the data uh, is that uh, we have very few cases of people that have been reporting, observing people getting back to Boko Haram or themselves going back to Boko Haram. The caveat with this uh, data might be that it's a self-reporting uh, in terms of recidivism. But uh, we see also that when, uh, as Shoban said, you know, uh, discussing the situation of people uh, that are getting out of those groups, uh, being in Boko Haram or mainly those uh, CGTF and other groups, it's very difficult for people getting away definitely uh, from those groups while the conflict is still on and while most of those groups are around. So we see that in a case, uh, there was still some kind of collaboration with those groups. And mainly when talking about CGTF, uh, it's a kind of uh, community in uh, for those people being part of the CGTF and defending the communities. And we see that uh, following gender lines, women are more implicated uh, in um, work like uh, support, like uh, cleaning or cooking, uh, etc. And we also, uh, about recidivism, uh, try to see, you know, uh, compare the situation that people have been living when they were within the groups that they used to be with. And uh, uh, most of the case, people are reporting that the situation within those groups were worse than the situation they are living actually. But uh, in a place like Niger, we come across a good number of people that actually um, test testimony that they have been uh, living better when they were with Boko Haram or that the situation actually uh, is the same than uh, when they were uh, with Boko Haram. And this is uh, simply to be aligned on the fact that uh, when people leave those groups, the expectations are very high. And if we try to contextualize it, it's also because of the calls that have been made by the different states, uh, asking people to get out of those groups and to benefit uh, in a place like Niger of amnesty and getting through reintegration programs. And then when the results and the outcomes of those reintegration programs are low, those people are likely then uh, to uh, have a, a negative um, a view on the situation they are actually living, and this also some, something that needs uh, to be considered. Uh, regarding people's well-being, uh, psychologic, uh, psychological well-being is also something very, very important. And we have been talking about uh, victimization. Uh, in line with that uh, high rate of victimization uh, being associated with uh, uh, Boko Haram mainly uh, than the CGTF and other groups is also very linked with the possibility uh, for people then having psychological wounds. Uh, in all the countries, actually, uh, those people uh, are experiencing trauma, and uh, this also something that needs to be considered, uh, because when we consider the four countries, uh, mainly uh, Niger, Cameroon, uh, and Chad, uh, the lack of professionals make it very difficult uh, in the reintegration programs uh, considering the possibility uh, of psychological help for people that uh, went through Boko Haram. Oh, uh, about well-being also, uh, now to finish, uh, if you consider some indicators uh, like um, accessing land uh, for agriculture, food security, uh, and also source of, uh, source of income. We observe also that the situation of, of all the people that have been living Boko Haram actually compared to those that have been living in the different communities, although the situation for uh, those uh, community members is uh, already there, is very different. So they access less land. They also uh, are food insecure more than the community members, and they also uh, don't access any source of income uh, except the help that have been given uh, by the different uh, organizations. So, uh, despite uh, this situation, then that uh, actually looks very uh, complicated in terms of uh, psychological uh, well-being, but also economic and social well-being, uh, we end this presentation on something that is important. Uh, I think that Bukhar have been talking about the receptivity of the communities. But here, uh, we would like to finish with the way uh, people perceive the future within the communities and the way the communities perceive also the future of people that have been getting out of Boko Haram. And we see that in general, uh, except maybe in, uh, 
in Cameroon, uh, people are very ho hopeful about the possibility for themselves becoming successful members of their, communi their communities. And at the same time, communities also think that they could, uh, if they receive uh, any kind of help, also become successful members of the communities. Meaning that uh, it, this is a possibility uh, that should be considered uh, as a way to uh, work for more receptivity for people living in Boko Haram. I would like to end up uh, by stressing two things. First uh, is uh, the situation uh, with uh, psychological traumas. Uh, as I said, because of the lack of professionals, this is something that is not really considered. And people are more insisting on economic aspects and social aspects. But this is also something that needs to be uh, considered seriously, uh, mainly when talking about children. Uh, there is also uh, the necessity to capitalize on uh, the willingness of people becoming successful members of their communities, but also uh, the perception of the community on them uh, as a possible uh, successful member of the communities to work on that to foster uh, communities' receptivity. Thank you. Thank you, Ramaji. And I think that's a great segue, actually. Um, you know, to, for, for people coming out of armed groups to be able to see another life for themselves, but also for the community to see some possibility, or to allow some space for people to transform. And I think, Sajad, to hear from you um, on what you're seeing in this, in this particular uh, transition, but especially also from the community perspective of like what people expect. Thanks, Shabon. Uh, Natalie says I've been up here for the past two days, so. I think uh, she's saying everyone's had enough of me talking. Uh, if you haven't, I'm speaking Iraqi politics tomorrow at NYU's Kavokian Center at 5.30. Just plugging there. Um, so I'm going to be speaking from the Iraqi context. Um, and maybe some, I don't know if you can call them facts, but maybe some, um, some useful uh, ideas that can be transferred to other contexts. So firstly, those who are demobilized voluntarily or involuntarily, want to be reintegrated. It's not like they want to avoid that. They want to be reintegrated, particularly those who, like I said, who have suffered injuries and so on. They wanted a pathway back into civil society. They wanted to be able to go to work. They wanted to be able to care for their families. They wanted to be accepted by um, their communities. They weren't looking to avoid that. So I think that's something we should keep in mind, that um, a lot of these people who have been demobilized want to be reintegrated. They don't need to be convinced to be reintegrated, but they just haven't been given the opportunities. The second is if, um, if we do offer effective reintegration programming, we have to preserve the person's social standing and their dignity and avoid uh, harm in the long run. In the short run, maybe the program will be successful, but once the program is up and it's over, maybe that leads to that person's harm in their community, something that we need to keep in mind. And so that means the context is very important, and it means the priority should be giving programming to those who most need it. But the programming needs to be sustainable, it needs to be scalable, and it needs to be replicable across context. Otherwise, if we go in, lots of resources, we do a fantastic job for 18 months, and then we leave those community members, and then the program is no longer sustainable, you can imagine the long-term sort of negative effect. So something we need to be very wary of is um, there's a lot of attention when there is a conflict. When the conflict stops, the resources dry up, and then we see programs like uh, reintegration programs suddenly uh, disappear. And then those members suffer because governments do not step in to uh, continue that, that programming. So it's something to be aware of. I can actually see it happening in Iraq at this moment in time. There's much less funding for programs in Iraq than there was a few years ago. When there was ISIS and so on, there was a lot of attention. Now there isn't. And so we can see a lot of programs are just sort of falling apart because there's no more sustainability for that. From, from what I can gather, the, the pathway to a successful program means you have to operate where you're going to get some sort of backing slash approval by the government and at least some sort of uh, grudging approval by the armed groups that you are working with or the members from those armed groups. Otherwise, they will target that program. So in the instance, um, and Abdul Muratim has gone, but in the instance, for example, in Basra, uh, UN agency was doing some work there. They just stepped on the wrong toes. 
and their programming had to come to, to a halt. So uh, I was just suggesting to them that they should try, first of all, instead of going directly into the programming, talk to those groups to say, hey, which of your members or former members need support and we can offer support for them, rather than trying to offer support directly to people without letting those groups know that you know, this is what the intention is. Because otherwise, they'll think you're trying to poach their members, you're trying to promote demobilization, and we already talked about how, um, how dangerous that can be. So the program needs to be not seen as a threat to, to mobilization or to membership of those groups. It needs to be seen as something that is uh, compensatory in a way to make up for lack of government service, to make up for some sort of provision that that group is not able to offer. For example, physically rehabilitating people, people with injuries. The groups are not doing that. The government is really struggling with that. If somebody comes in with your integration program that focuses on that, it's not going to be seen as much of a threat. You're not trying to promote demobilization. However, if you do the reintegration programming well, it's going to be hopefully seen as something that somebody wants to aspire to before they join a group. So that in the future, they'll say, hey, before I join this armed group, there are other pathways for me in society. There's this program that teaches you skills. There's this program that prepares you for work in, uh, in, in, in employment or, or life in employment. I don't need to be part of an armed group in order to fulfill some of the things that I want in society. So it's got to be um, a successful program that people can see, not successful just in terms of metrics and ticking boxes, how many people are in, how much money did we spend, how well did we do. Really, it's got to be the society and, the, and the, the, the community that you're targeting that says, hey, this was really successful. Because then, before people join armed groups, they'll say there's other pathways we've seen that can accept, um, can accept our, our members as well. Um, I don't want to go on too much. I'll just say that um, my understanding uh, in the Iraqi context for the para people that join paramilitary groups, so not ISIS and Al-Qaeda, is till, till right now, there hasn't been, um, if you speak to them, there hasn't been awareness of much successful reintegration programming. So the people that we interviewed, or I interviewed in Basra, but people we spoke to in Sinjar, in Tal Afar, in Tikrit, for example, uh, in Ambar province, generally there wasn't sort of, yes, yeah, that program, I went to that, or I've heard about this, and this was really well done. Most people had no idea there were any reintegration program. And you can imagine how much the UN and other agencies have spent uh, in resources in Iraq, and yet pretty much all the target groups and, and community members have not heard of reintegration program, are not aware of it. I'm not saying there isn't, but I'm saying those people are not aware. So that's also one of the metrics that we should look for, is how many people are actually aware there is reintegration programming. Otherwise, if it's just me and you, Shib, one that are aware, and we think we're doing a great job, but the actual target group doesn't know about it, then I don't think that's a metric for success. That's probably a metric for failure. Thank you. As you can tell from Sajid's presentation, the reason he's been up here so many times is because he can deliver really concise analysis and tap right into sort of the policy or programming implications. We can see them in the distance with that presentation. I think you raised a ton there between strategic comms, thinking about programs as a process themselves with each round of people coming out and being happy with it or finding su successful transitions or knowing about it the program and process changes, right? And you get more buy-in. And the political part, which we haven't talked about a lot, uh, with armed groups and other government stakeholders, making sure you go to the power brokers and get buy-in, and that may also depend on how you sell it. You can frame it differently. And I think these are all really insightful points that you see throughout the case study, so thank you. I now want to take to a slightly different approach here. So we've been talking a lot about sort of the evidence base at sort of the meta level, really at the granular level, the experiences of particular contexts. And now I think there's this question of, well, how do we put this into practice? Um, and how, and I think some of the other things that have come up over the last two days are about the frame. What frame you start with is so important for sort of where you go and how, you know, how evidence-based you are in sort of the guidance and the uh, interventions that you create. And so I'm very excited uh, that Valerie can join us from UNODC to talk about a process they've just been through to try to think through how do we do this in a way um, that, that gets us towards the reintegration outcomes that we want in a rights-based way. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Shavan, to give us this opportunity. I think it's really important. 
uh, I met a lot of people, actually, I met everyone for the <laughs> first time, and I learned a lot. Uh, I think it's an incredible opportunity for us to exchange ideas, views, um, to be open also, and I'm going to ask you to be open, <laughs> because uh, I'm going to share maybe another perspective, and another perspective about assessment of children. And so my name is Valérie. I'm a clinical and forensic psychologist. Uh, I work uh, with the UNODC. Uh, I'm based in Vienna, the HQ. And I work for a program um, which is a global program to end violence against children. I think it's important that before that I go directly on the framework and the method that I'm going to uh, present as an alternative, I would say, for uh, assessment of children, um, that I uh, talk a little bit about the context and why we decided to work on assessment, why we uh, worked on child assessment, and especially on child assessment of children associated with armed group, organized criminal group. And I, we use this uh, terminology, we talked a lot about terminology sometimes, say, uh, children um, associated with groups designated as terrorist groups, you know? So um, this is something important. Um, so, as I explained, I work for the UNODC, and uh, UNODC is part of the Secretariat. And we are supporting several countries, uh, a lot of countries. So, I will not talk about this one specific country. This also is really important for you to understand. Uh, we work in Iraq. I was recently in Iraq, in Nigeria, in Indonesia, in Central Asia, Uzbekistan, uh, Tajikistan, etc. Um, but uh, I will not talk a specific country here. But I will share also specific examples, just for you to have an idea also of um, the feedback that I received from professionals on the ground. Uh, also, it's important for this context for you to understand that we uh, promote a systemic approach to preventing and responding to crime against um, children. And um, with this approach, this specific approach, um, is to understand the crimes as a complex phenomenon. Um, we uh, also work with different actors. And when I'm talking about different actors, we have access to uh, the security actors and we have access to the child protection actors. And thanks to this access, I would say we can receive different views and we can work on this dichotomy that we can observe sometimes uh, between the security sectors and the child protection sectors. And when I talked about dichotomies, I, you, you will see that I talk also between confusion of roles. Uh, this is something that we could observe, uh, where sometimes we can see a social workers uh, working on the security aspect, and these do not contribute positively in the reintegration of children because they are collecting information absolutely not helpful for um, the programs. Um, sometimes uh, the security actors, because of a lack or so of resources and because some children need psychological support, try to help the children. <laughs> and because they are the first one, uh, I'm talking about militaries, etc., who are receiving the children and they try to face some, um, with this issue of psychological and physical uh, violence that uh, the children went through. So we, uh, we promote an approach to overcome this um, perception of dichotomy between the security sectors and the children uh, protection. Something important as well, <laughs> It's um, the fact that we are talking about children and uh, the legal status of these children. Children uh, who have been recruited and exploited by this group, and this is really important, should be considered and treated permanently as victims. We discussed about that. It's important because uh, the perception that we have will determine, and you will see how, the choice of the assessment that we will, we will uh, choose. And the choice and the approach of the assessment will determine the interventions. 
And the intervention will determine if our program of reintegration is successful or not. So um, this is something important. I would like just also to raise that yesterday, especially we talked about social peace. Uh, I really like <laughs> this <laughs> terminology, social peace. I will tell you why. Because um, most of the time when I talk with people, actually I have uh, security actors, I have intelligence services in the room. And in the meantime, I will have psychologists, social workers who are working in the rehabilitation center. And um, the goal is to try to find the common understanding. And I start with the social peace. I said, that actually, I think that all of us try to reach this ultimate goal. And I'm going to keep this ultimate goal in mind when I'm going to choose my approach for the assessment of children. I'm going to keep this ultimate goal in my, my mind when I'm going to say that it's really important, and this is what we are promoting, the, that we reintegrate children into society. Because this will contribute to social peace. So you will start to understand where I want to come step by step. Uh, you will say that, yes, of course, Valérie, we all want the reintegration of children. Of course, we want to work, we agree on this social peace. But I'm asking a question. So it means that if we, are, we really would like this rehabilitation, this reintegration of children, how do we perceive children? Because the first thing that any actors do when they meet a child, oh my God, is, <laughs> is, to, um, is to assess children. And you know which, which type of assessment? A risk assessment. The risk assessment, and now I'm going to share uh, the concerns that we observe. We had to work with professionals who had asked requests for technical assistance, saying, okay, we, you need to help us to assess children. OK, share me these templates, please. Risk assessment. But we have an issue, because when I assess children, I collect information which will be used against children. Unfortunately, risk assessment is focused on negative aspect. I'm looking on the negative aspect. It's focused on the prediction. I'm trying to predict. It's a probability issue. And I predict something about a risk that could happen. And to avoid this risk, what should I do? I just eliminate the risk. How do we eliminate the risk? We deprive children of liberty. How do we eliminate the risk? We put children in what we call rehabilitation center. And actually, we do not have risk. I'm going to share another concern about risk assessment before that I'm going to share one sentence about the suggested approach. I discussed with some children who have been assessed red. Oh, you know how it works, huh? You are red, you are orange, OK? And uh, I just shared water. <laughs> OK, um, want to drink? Do you want to drink? And the question was, why are you nice with me? Are you not scared of me? Say, why? Because I'm red. You should be scared. Say, OK, are you scared of yourself? Yeah. Of course, I'm dangerous. I never thought before this interview that this risk assessment can create an identity issues, and a big one on these children. Another point about risk assessment, and this is really important, that um, the fact that the risk factor, and this I'm talking about people who conduct assessments, um, is a concept of probability, not causality. This is really important, what I'm saying now. It means that risk conditions are not necessarily linked to the appearance of a negative outcome. This confusion can lead to inappropriate psychosocial intervention, and sometimes, because we are focusing on the risk, and we are confused between the risk and the needs, we are unfortunately providing the wrong um, advice. And uh, for the reintegration programs, we are putting a lot of money in the wrong psychosocial intervention. Now, 
I can talk a lot about it, but I will in one minute. Okay, one minute. <laughs> Just said. Okay, I had to explain everything to tell you now why we need to think together about another approach. We need to think about another approach, first of all, because we need to find an efficient approach. We need to find an efficient approach with the purpose of reintegrate children into society. And for those, we worked uh, with different actors on, first of all, the different step of assessment to be sure because assessment is a process as well. It's not an event. It means it's not an interview. It's not a questionnaire. So to be sure that all the step of the assessment will help for the reintegration. Um, and the best approach in this context for us should uh, meet three criteria. First of all, <laughs> pres preserve children's rights during assessment process. When I'm talking about assessment process, I include recommendation in reports. Okay. So we need to be sure that the assessment process preserves children's rights. The second one, respond to children's needs during assessment process. The needs of children should be met during assessment process, including in the recommendation. And the third one, being sure that we respond to the purpose. And risk-based approach, what we call the preventive, uh, the predictive approach, we try to predict what will happen, probability. The purpose is to eliminate the risk, not to reintegrate, not to promote strengths, not to uh, work on the resilience. And in conclusion, and I cannot explain everything, but just for you, it's a, it's a suggestion. We worked on another approach, which is called a resilience approach. This resilience approach do not neglect the risk aspect, the environment. We talked about vulnerabilities. We are aware of the circumstances of the children. We just try to find an alternative. So, um, voila. <laughs> um, this is what we uh, would like to share. Um, please, it's, a qu it's just to open also the, for everyone to think about it. Just for you to understand everywhere, everywhere where I've been since two years I work with uh, the UNODC, people ask me to help them on risk assessment, to work on reintegration uh, programs. There is no link. Okay? This is important. We need to think and find alternative to get together. Thank you. I think that's a really great, it continues this theme of sort of how you frame a problem or how you frame a question will really determine what answer you get. And so I think that's a really important reminder. Now I'm going to give the very difficult job to someone who's very capable of, of handling it. Um, Natalie from IOM is a, a long-term partner, but also really helpful, because we've asked her to do this numerous times, in helping us sort of dissect uh, evidence to really think about the implications for practice. So. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you um, to all of you for these presentations and these insights. Indeed, this is not easy. Um, and I've jotted down a lot of things, and now I have, yeah, you know, it's going pretty much every direction. But I'll try to suggest an approach, uh, just to try and, and sum this up a little bit, with two axes. I think it's important to think, when we're thinking about effective reintegration programming, first of all, about the setting, the conditions, the environment. And even if uh, I think in the opening uh, event, my principal described this as a, a truism, um, we need to really focus on government ownership and uh, institutional uh, or interinstitutional coordination for the success of these uh, programs. This is really uh, fundamental. I think that it's interesting because it's a bit of a paradox also in that we actually ask a lot of the time of the people who have taken arms against the state to go into a program that is led by the same state. So we need to be able to deal with that. I think that's one um, maybe dimension of this um, truism that I'd like to add. 
Another thing that is important for us when thinking about ownership um, is to think about our own responsibility also as practitioners as we go into um, these settings. And we've heard a lot, especially in the workshops, that managing uh, exits and reintegration programs need to be demand-driven. And for that reason, I think it's also our responsibility to go in and to provide support with one clear coordinated message and to avoid opening different channels or to avoid seeming like we're in, in competition. Um, so that's important, I think, for us to keep in mind. Um, the second element of the setting or the environment that I'd like to uh, stress is that if we think as reintegration as um, prerequisite really for sustainable peace, um, then it's useful to step out of the security lens and really take a rights-based approach to it and try to take the best out of many disciplines and approaches and tools um, to really strive to reestablish social lies and social ties, sorry, between um, former um, members or combatants and the communities. And I like what Ramaji said about acknowledging also victimization, and we've discussed this a lot uh, in the past two days, this blurred um, notion of perpetrator and victim. So taking a victim-centered approach, I think, is also useful uh, for the success of these programs. We see that from a, from a, a practical point of view. Um, I'm going to throw the word transitional justice in there. Traditionally, DDR is under the guarantees of non-repetition as a tool. I think we need to challenge this and think of DDR differently um, as something that can go beyond that in terms of a, a more broader peace-building tool. Um, and that brings me to the notion of um, transformation and precisely looking at um, these reintegration programs as something that can try to challenge some of the structures that we're working on. And of course, this is when I bring in uh, the aspect of gender and women. We've talked a lot about the fact that the different roles of women are not sufficiently acknowledged. And um, I think that these programs and the reintegration content can really contribute to transforming some of the structural um, vulnerabilities, and I'd like for us to think about managing exits also in that way. Um, in that sense, maybe we need to think also about reintegration programming as an opportunity to change the mindset of a culture of glorification of arms carrier, a culture of, of guns, and that's something that if we integrate it um, in these programs, I think we can have a real impact on. Um, and that's more going into what Sajad was saying about the transformation of uh, stereotypes and cultural norms, uh, etc. Um, and then, of course, the second element on top of the content or the conditions is the uh, on top of the condition. Sorry, is the content. Um, so, if we focus on social connections, I think that's been a key message of these two days. Social connections are key, and we've learned this from a long time in more traditional DDR that we shouldn't focus only on the individual. Uh, then, of course, we need to strive building a mutual understanding, a shared future between the community and the individual. Um, and what is useful and what is particularly useful with these types of programs like MIAC is that it allows us to build feedback mechanisms in these processes that allow us to draw the lessons from the communities back into the designing and the political decision-making um, process. And that's where I really see um, one important element for sustainability and, and efficiency of, of these types of programs. And then, of course, not wanting to repeat any of the specifics, but uh, uh, one key element uh, I think we've, we've heard is that we need to have a tailored process to the individual needs and expectations, even if that is more cumbersome than trying to devise something that is more generic. It's important. And to do proper care management, again, in a longitudinal way and monitoring in a longitudinal way is really key uh, to sustaining efficiency. And there again is where research helps us also 
as a complement um, for, for these types of programs. That's it. Thank you to everyone.